basically what I want to concentrate on in my little talk is the carbon footprint of beer. Next slide, please. When we look at what we have facing us, uh, we have an awful lot of crisis when you look at it. Financial, food, water, energy, the uh, movement of people, uh, migration, resource depletion, waste contamination. Um, so there's a lot on our plates at the moment. And there have been loads of meetings. And when we look at the meetings, they're all very good and everybody's uh, interested. But the issue comes that there's a lot of talking. Many of the dates are set a long, long way out. And on the ground, not a huge amount is achieved. Uh, hopefully, this will change now, as, as Giles was saying, with the um, World Summit, the G7, uh, shortly in, in uh, Devon or Cornwall, and uh, COP26 in Cambridge. So perhaps better things are coming. So here, I just wanted to deal with sustainable development. And we all talk about it, but it's quite difficult to get your head around what it actually means. I think the simplest terms is intergenerational justice. We cannot eat the planet and leave nothing behind for our children and grandchildren. I'm 70, I'm an old man, and I sit there and I'm going to have to one day stand in front of my children and grandchildren and they're going to say, Dad, what did you do about it? And I don't, and the reason, one of the reasons I'm doing this is I don't want to be standing there and say nothing. So we must all have, take our own responsibility in doing something about it. And one of the avenues is to look at reducing our carbon footprint and the possible impact that has on climate change. In uh, uh, deciding on the carbon footprint, there are a variety of things that we have to look at. First of all, the carbon footprint is a measure of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and what we find there is it's not just CO2. We're also other emissions, and Nigel had this in his slide, a methane, which is 25% times more insulating than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide, which is given out during uh, tilling the soil, 296 times more insulating than carbon dioxide. And there's HCFC, which was a refrigerant gas, 1,760 times more insulating than carbon dioxide. So we have got to cut back on those. Um, I've got some information, not on the slide, but in uh, 1800, the parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere was 283. Uh, in 1900, it was 297. In 2000, it's risen to 370 parts per million, and by 2020, 414. So we can see that the atmospheric CO2 is going up. This is an average figure. I'm sure lots of people will have different values. Uh, we then look at uh, temperature, mean global temperature, and we find that in uh, 1800, the Earth's temperature was round about 13.7. 1900 100 years later 13 points well one was 13.742 13.74 2000 14.5 and uh, 2020 15. so that's an average increase or net increase of 1.28 degrees c the paris accord said we must keep our temperature raised below 1.5 degrees c um if if possible and at two degrees c we were really going to see some major impacts so there is this pressure to try and minimize carbon emissions to try and reduce our carbon footprint so they're legal requirements the governments are signing up to all sorts of measures as you see, but they can't just do it without help although they also can help supply the solution We've got to optimise resources. If we can reduce losses, we end up with more product. Each bottle of beer then has a smaller carbon footprint. We can look at the objectives and the impact of everything we buy. I mean, there's an, 
an interesting one at the moment where many brewers sorry <coughs> choose to go for canning rather than bottling because the carbon uh, impact of canning is less optimizing distribution systems man using management such as ipbc sorry <coughs> i've got a frog um supplier partnerships being socially responsible and supporting our community and our employees to try and get better um interaction between them and hence be supportive and develop and develop the community and also like i have to a certain extent i want to save the planet it's an altruistic i i'm probably not going to be here to see it but i don't want my kids having to learn to swim because that's the only thing they can do so that's the kyoto protocol uh, co2 um, equivalent emissions um so uh and of course we are targeted with getting uh climate goals by 2050 to decarbonize the world it's quite a big ask but when we come to the end we perhaps can see some opportunities so here we have a look at the carbon emissions which vary across countries you can see that we're sort of sitting in the middle of the patch at 6.5 uh, tons of co2 per citizen uh, so you know but you look down at the bottom india chad brazil uh, you know are very low now the problem we have facing is that everybody wants to aspire to a good standard of living like australia canada and the united states uh, and if we all move in that direction there is this huge reservoir of carbon emissions that are likely to come so, and we cannot sit here in all conscience and tell, you know, we're all right. We've got nice central heating and comfortable homes, but developing countries aren't allowed to grow and prosper to reach our standard of living. That is totally unacceptable. So we've got to think of ways of helping them achieve their goals, but without excess uh, carbon dioxide evolution. So it's an interesting slide. Part of the reason why ours is lower is because we've been very good at managing our energy uh, with a lot of wind farm and we've actually been for days completely independent of fossil fuel here's an interesting slide where you look at various activities we can do uh, and i've put down a pint of kernel at pale ale and a bottle of kernel pale ale and if you convert that to liters we can see that 0.16 of a ton of co2 if we had a bottle of, uh, had a liter of beer every day not unreasonable which is 2.5 percent of our total carbon footprint individually it's not very uh, major but when you look at it it's all contributing to it with to contributing to our carbon footprint and you can see flying is pretty expensive this is a carbon footprint that I took from data uh, that's on uh, that's freely available from uh, New Belgium Brewery. And you can see that actually at the end of the day, our um, carbon footprint due to uh, brewing is actually quite small. And the big ones, as Nigel was pointing out, was barley and malt. Um, and retail in this one is huge. As you can see, the top line uh, of, of the graph and what's happening there is of course refrigeration that the beer in america is employed cold distribution is quite big because this is an international company that sends their beer all over the states and does export as well by contrast kernel it's a slightly different picture the actual net uh, value of sierra nevada was uh 1.5 uh 1500 grams of co2 equivalent whereas uh for kernel is only 877 uh, grams equivalent and the major differences come from simple things that happen in the production and the distribution so the differences are the fact that they're not exactly measuring the same thing admins in one not in the other um in kernel is an ale with 
isothermal single temperature mashing, whereas uh, fat tire uses program mashing. So there's a better energy balance in isothermal mashing. You've got cooler fermentation temperatures in fat tire compared to uh, fermentation temperatures for ales, 12 to 14 for, uh, for lagers, 20 for ales. Um, very little cold storage of, of ales, whereas there's significant cold storage of lagers. Even though it's a pale ale, it's still treated quite like a lager in many ways. Distribution, local around London or national across the whole of the United States. And all the money that's spent is keeping it cold in trade. We can drink our beer at ambient. In America, they like to drink their beer at two to four degrees Celsius. So it's all the refrigeration required. So it's quite fascinating to see how these sort of differences drive the carbon footprint and gives us an indication of opportunities to reduce it. We saw from Nigel's presentation that barley accounts for 23 to 30 percent of the carbon footprint of beer. And what can we do about it? Well, we can source our materials locally. Um, so we can get local maltsters. We can use traditional bar barley varieties. One of the things that's been happening is uh, quite interesting, and that is that we're finding land for land race varieties of barley are actually more adapted to the changes in climate. So some of the uh, old historic varieties are going quite well. Lower yield, but they, they can tolerate the droughts that we've been having a little bit. Um, organic barley, you can see here that actually by using organic barley, we can actually reduce our um, actual carbon footprint growing and malting the barley. So um, intensively farmed barley at one hand in a new high high value pneumatic maltings or organic barley at a floor malting there's a 38 percent reduction in the carbon footprint now the new maltings are quite likely uh, to be able to produce really good results in the future so there are things we can do perhaps the leader in the whole of this and when we were going to have it as a face to face meeting we had invited ken grossman who's the owner founder and the most passionate environmental person to come and talk to us but he has really embraced zero waste um, he grows his own barley and hops he has a battery of solar power uh, solar uh, uh, electricity generation he's got all virtually no waste everything is reused recycled repurposed and so it's absolutely brilliant so he's diverting tons and tons of potential carbon uh, wastage in but actually the lesson is is not just the ability to save carbon it actually saves money and all these things where you're not wasting it where you're not throwing things away and repurposing or reusing it is actually a revenue saving so it's actually a win-win situation so absolutely brilliant uh, when you look at it but you don't have to be a great mega brewery and this is where craft breweries smaller scale breweries have a really good value and this is circularity so here we have ramsbury brewery which is a built on a farm they use coppice wood they're firing their still and their brew house their steam generator they roll the cars down the hill okay it's their only pub but and they obviously have distribution it's a nice story they grow their own barley which is malted at warminster which is some 30 miles 40 miles away uh, their spent grains goes to feed their animals who um, fertilize the barley and help it grow they have effluent treatment through reed beds and lagoon and their hops is coming from Hereford, possibly, which is about 70 miles away. So all of a sudden you can have a community and you can actually reduce your, your um, various inputs. And if we look at the hierarchy of what can we do, we can remove, not use it in the first place. Can we not do without? Do we need to add beta gluconate? No, we probably can get away with it. If we have good quality barley reduced by design so can we cut out unnecessary things 
design using cans instead of bottles as i use reuse can we reuse things such as brewing vessels we don't throw them away we just clean them and use them for another day returnables cask eggs and and returnable bottles fantastic you know that really does save money as we'll see in the next slide uh, refurbish just because it's broken it doesn't have to be thrown away we can repurpose it we can repair it if you go to places in africa or asia nothing gets thrown away it's all reused and then at the end of the day the people walk on the tires that were too bald to be used on your van and they're used as soles of the shoes it's brilliant i mean it's a caring everything has a value there remanufacture so we can actually return things such as cans which have a high recyclable value repurpose we have all these all our chemicals supplied in beautiful plastic drums they are perfect yeast storage vessels and water butts and and so many other things and then recycle we take our hot water back uh, after work cooling and use it for rebrewing we already do a lot of things we should reimagine what we can do to improve that situation packaging is one of our big things um, the actual packaging operation is not so big but actually uh, the package itself and one trip bottles as you can see at the bottom uh, can use up to about 25 percent recycled glass provided we recycle it and that's the other problem once somebody's bought a bottle how good are they at getting it back to the uh, bottle manufacturer so it can be melted down and used returnable bottles 30 trips but we've got out of that habit deposits are going to come in and perhaps make people recycle aluminium cans we can recycle steel cans more kegs we can reuse so our choices in how we send out our beer is good um, next slide please and also you can see this is a very old piece of work but how adnams actually two bottles have exactly the same capacity they're both 500 uh, 400 and 500 mil broadside bottles but just by light weighting they've managed to save 600 tons of glass 400 ton 410 tons of carbon dioxide so you know we can use our imagination climate change is here to stay we are not going to get away from it and companies and consumers all contribute to co2 so we need to have everybody part of the show we have got to have our supplier we have got to involve government who have a big part to play in making things available such as renewable electricity and they have both a stick in forcing us to do to, to operate in some behaviors and a carrot in terms of discounts and promotions um, if we do um if we do produce a, a carbon footprint what worries me is that everybody's starting to produce their own carbon footprint the pressure is going to be huge and the issue then is how truthful is it and giles touched on that if we're going to have a carbon footprint and we're going to compare one brewery with another if we leave large chunks out well we won't bother putting the packaging in. Uh, you know that's not under our control then here we are stuck uh, trying to compare apples with oranges so we do need a standard and an authority it's going to be like HACCP where you have it regulated I don't like regulation but there's really not much we can do about it if we want to have an honest argument we need partnerships with government suppliers customers and trade um, and we can do a lot by simple fixing I'm coming along with Giles and, um, and uh, Nigel. Um, offsetting is going to be part of the program, unavoidable. But it is an elastoplast. It is to fix something that's immediately broken. It's not a long-term solution. And probably carbon zero, even though that's what we're aspiring to, isn't enough. And we're going to have to look at carbon capture, actually to go negative our product takes carbon out of the environment and helps survive there um, so and here we can see a simple thing which is quite funny and that is uh, that after the um, Kyoto protocol in 1992 
um, all government signed up to things, and I think the brewing industry signed up to a 17% reduction in the carbon footprint. And that, ironically, was achieved because we had all the miners' strikes, the closure of the pits, and the transfer of, of electrical generation from coal based to gas based. So actually, the brewing industry didn't have to do much. It all happened because our electricity now was much more sustainable. I mean, well, uh, it's sort of kind of fraud, but we can see how it's really impacting. This is driven by government. You know, coal is still there, but it's now really dwindled to virtually nothing. Gas is coming down and the renewables are coming up everywhere. And there are have been days in the year when it's been very sunny and also very windy that we've actually survived 100 percent on renewable energy so it's uh it's great and offsetting is the last resort i did say i would mention a little bit about xavier's offsetting that's a mermaid gin and i phoned him up this afternoon because i wanted to find out and he's now working with hampshire and isle of Wight wildlife trust uh, to look at uh, seagrass growing in the uh, Solent rather than a reforestation program in Panama. I think it's nice to see our ideas coming back home in a slightly more relevant uh, situation. So this brings us to what, we're, what the main point is. We are going to be asked or required at some stage to produce or want to produce a carbon footprint. It can either be really, really taxing, cost you lots of money, employ really high powered consultants, and everybody will disagree with what uh, what should be included and what not and use different bases. Or you could have a standard one. To take something simple like barley, it shouldn't be up to us, the brewers, to work it out. You buy barley, when you buy barley, it comes in with an extract yield, it comes in at a price per kilo, and it should come in with its carbon footprint, 360 grams per kilo or whatever. And then you just can plug that in. Not every brewery, not all 2,000 of these craft breweries should all sit down and, and interrogate their malts to find out what their carbon footprint is. We then have the things in red, which are things under our control. We have some control over the amount of electricity we use in refrigeration, the amount of gas or fuel we use, and also where we buy them, because there's going to be greener sources, uh, our waste, and how we can recycle, the admin costs, packaging. We have some say over packaging. Some of that will come that instead of working out uh, what the carbon footprint of a bottle is, the bottle supplier will do that. We just have to work out how much it costs to fill. And then there are things that are, I call grey or brown areas, which is transport, distribution, and of course, uh, retail. And these are all areas where we have some input, but there are other people involved in that. And when we do a carbon footprint, it has to got to be inclusive. It, the, to be meaningful, it has got to be from planting the barley through to drinking the glass of beer in the pub it has got to have a the complete supply chain and we have to have a list so that everybody includes all the aspects and then this is only a working document from here we can then use that to highlight areas of improvement i've already got ahead of myself so you can see the green items principally come from suppliers and they should be able to supply much more meaningful carbon footprints and save us a whole load of effort in work calculating. There are six maltsters in the UK. I said 12, but I was corrected by Nigel. There are six maltsters in the UK, um, you can get them to do it. I mean, Nigel's already got it. I know he's working with other people that a malting calculator should, a carbon footprint calculator, should be available. The red ones, and really we should just need to know what our electricity bill is, how many kilowatts we use, and then multiply that by a factor. And we have a choice of where we buy our electricity. And there is um, electricity that comes entirely from renewable sources. And then the black lines are going to be a bit more difficult. I've left something like hops out. 
when I look at the carbon footprint calculations, hops represents about 0.6% of the total carbon footprint. It's not worth, as Nigel was saying, a whole load of effort to get, eh, is it New Zealand hops? And what about the shipping compared to getting Hereford hops? And can we, in point zero six, you're not going to save a lot, whatever. So, you know, at some stage it may be important. This is a working document. It's a movable thing. But initially, let's find the uh, easy to pick fruit, the low hanging fruit. So we've got to somehow persuade our industry. I can't do it. And no individual brewery can do it. That the Family Brewers Association, SEBA, uh, the British Beer and Pub Association, the Maltsters Association, TB, all these organizing groups should come together and help us develop a simple calculator that can be just easily applied by anybody wanting to uh, to be able to use it um, and we need somebody to fund that um, I'm talking to Giles who was our previous speaker who's already done something for the restaurants he's now doing a carbon footprint in pubs um, you know it is not it's probably a year if you talk to Nigel to come up with a pro forma template that everybody could use just like a hazard format and we can then use that and when we've got it we can celebrate it. we can use it as a working document to see where we should put our effort how can we bring our carbon footprint down um and i will let eric have some of my low-hanging fruit anytime he likes he can come and but he'll have to wait until the autumn when the, when the fruits ripe in my garden doing nothing is not an option you cannot sit there and pretend it'll go away. It will not go away. And neither will my grandchildren and your grandchildren, and possibly even so some of the younger in the audience will suffer. We can see it happening. Um, you know, you could deny global warming if you want. It doesn't really matter, but the events are obvious. Um, our stakeholders, the people that invest in our business, either by buying the product as customers, by investing cash in it uh, will expect it they will be demanding it you can see the amount of noise that's just been generated the pandemic is still alive and kicking in our world and yet we're now really almost refocusing on the uh, environmental impacts consumers will drive change and particularly in craft breweries we have a very educated and selective consumer group that tend to support that and they want to be able to actually really engage um, and we need to look at everything that gives a co2 impact and see how we can save it but the, before we can do that we've got to measure it so that we can actually see and focus the target on what is important unfortunately it's not the only problem we saw at the beginning all those other things plastics um, you know i mean shrink film not shrink film um oh the things you put around cans uh high code i mean it's a terrible thing i mean you've seen everybody saw david attenborough with that turtle with high cone around its neck i mean that is worth a million a million pictures you know it was perfect to see that damage it's doing i dive and i can see the rubbish and plastic um, one of the most disgraceful places in the world is a beautiful safari park just at the back of Nairobi. And in all the trees, there's these hanging plastic bags. You think, how can we treat our environment, our natural environment in a wild area and let all this rubbish go out? So, yes, everybody has to do something. And we've got to get carbon neutral. And it's got to include all other sources of pollution. It's probably a bit of a rant, but we're the only planet with beer. We have a responsibility and we're on a journey. 